This morning in our, our service, we're going to talk about some Christmas gifts. Uh, in fact, we're going to talk about the best gift, if you want to call it that, for Christmas. A gift that each and every one of us have received. And my goal this morning is to set your mind on something that I hope you'll take with you this week. Uh, especially given that this coming up weekend is Christmas. Now, do you remember the joy of being a kid on Christmas Day? What that felt like? I don't believe anyone is too old to remember that joy uh, of Christmas Day. I remember being a kid. I couldn't sleep the night before. The anticipation was killing me for Christmas to come. I can't remember how many years I tried in a row when I was young and believed in Santa Claus. I tried to catch him. That, I, I remember the joy of those days. Uh, normally by the time we got to this particular point of the year, the tree had been up, there were gifts under it, um, and I just knew something under that tree was for me. And that anticipation absolutely just was killing me. Now, of course, long before that day, my brother and I, I've got a younger brother, he's, he's 18 months younger than I am, we had already kind of picked out what we thought the best gift was. Now, normally in our mind, it was the biggest gift. That, that had to be the best because it was the biggest and then our family would get smart and start putting like weird gifts in big boxes just, just to trick you a little bit. But that was what we thought. So by the time we went to bed, we, we thought we had it figured out what the best gift was going to be for Christmas that year. Now, as I've gotten a little bit older, I tend to look at things uh, a little bit differently now. You know, the, the best Christmas gift for people is very different. Uh, everyone's situation is very different. For some, it is the biggest gift under a tree. For others, it has nothing to do with the tree. I was reading a story about a woman in Tampa, Florida, who uh, received a pretty incredible Christmas gift and it had nothing to do with the tree at all. She had been diagnosed with severe cardiomyopathy. I'm not a medical person, but what I do know about cardiomyopathy is that the only hope you have is a heart transplant. That's about it. That's, that's the only hope you have. And if you're not aware... Hearts do not come by very easily. Leading up to Christmas, she had become progressively weaker. More and more hope faded from her as her strength fled until about a week before Christmas. She received a call last year at 2 a.m. that a heart was on the way. Immediately by 4 a.m. she was in surgery and after many, many hours of surgery on into the next day, she pulled through. That was her Christmas gift. And she was asked about it later on, about this gift, and she said, you know what, that's the second time somebody's died for me. Her donor and her Lord and Savior, one saved her life, one saved her soul. Now, a gift like that doesn't come for all people. You heard Crystal's announcement and her emotional announcement about little Evelyn that we were praying for that passed away that also needed a heart and, and didn't get one. Life is fragile. Tomorrow is not guaranteed for a single person in this room. From the oldest in the room to the youngest in the room, nothing is guaranteed. So I pray this, as you go into the holidays, that you understand this very important fact, that the best gift is not under a tree at all. It's not in your house. It's not on a street corner. Yet it's for everyone and it's everywhere. The Christmas story, as it's been dubbed, is being told all over the country this weekend. Now, I have no issues with that. I love, I love that account. I love studying from Luke chapter 2. The problem with Luke chapter 2 is we fall short. We, we stop too soon. And so you'll hear something like this this weekend, Luke 2, 4 through 7. And, and that's kind of where it stops. Now, don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not belittling this whatsoever. <clears throat> this is a monumental point in history. Luke chapter 2, verse 4, Joseph went also up to Galilee from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. Verse 6, so it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there is no room for them in the inn. Now again, that is an important moment in history. I mean, think about that. People, Christians, if anyone doesn't like the idea of, of celebrating the birth of Christ, I don't really know what to even think about that. Because when I jump down to verse 13, I find that the angels in heaven were rejoicing at that moment. It's obviously a big moment. Their, their praise in verse 14 of Luke chapter 2 is glory to God in the highest. They were praising. 
And if the angels in heaven are going to rejoice a moment like that, that's good enough for me. Because what, of a gift, what a gift that truly is. And I've heard this said, and I always find this interesting. <clears throat> I can't believe that God would come and take on flesh be born in a manger. And not a palace or, or something like that of promise. I can't believe he would come and be born in a manger. And I hope you understand this. And this is what blows my mind. This is getting more into the true gift. See, to me, what's so amazing is not the fact that God was placed in a manger but that he would do all of that for a bunch of sinners. That's what's so amazing to me, that he would do that for sinners, knowing ahead of time that the majority of them would not repent, would not turn to him whatsoever, yet he was still willing to do that. So many people are going to read these passages today, and they're not going to go any further. They'll say, look, Luke chapter 2, that's the best gift. And leave out what it really means. Now, don't get me wrong, we should celebrate that, but we need to understand and go a little bit further. We talked about this last week, and I had to kind of be careful because I was starting to jump too far ahead. Uh, In our Bible study, I asked you this question. What is the greatest blessing you have today as a Christian? What is the true blessing Christianity offers? And I, I wanted to get your mind thinking about that if you were here in that Bible study hour. So many people will say something along the lines of, the gift of God is the happy life. The gift of God is the peaceful life. It's a life filled with good health and peace and prosperity. The gift of Christianity is morality. It's eternality. Those kind of things are are what you hear. And lots of ideas along those lines. Top of, of course, is normally the whole, the purpose of Christianity is to make me happy. That's the purpose of life is to live and be happy after all. But friends and brethren, those are not it. And I cannot express how important this is, whether it's the manger or the cross. It is important that you understand what this all means. So I want to look at a few different aspects this morning to try to help you understand this point. It's not possible to understand our greatest blessing without first understanding the greatest need that we have as Christians. What is it that you need the most? Worldly folks are going to give a worldly answer. If you're a worldly-minded person, you're going to say, well, more money would be nice. More possessions would be nice. Christians are typically going to give an answer along the lines of, well, my greatest need is, is to escape my sins. But you have to remember, your sins are not after you. Your sins aren't chasing you down the street. Now, I'm going to give you the answer <clears throat> that I hope you would have eventually arose to yourself. The greatest need that we have as Christians is to escape the wrath of God. That is your greatest need today. That is my greatest need. That is every single person's greatest need, is to escape the wrath of God. So well, I don't really know much about the, this whole idea of the wrath of God, but I'm going to show you some verses. See, Romans, Paul's letter to the Romans really lays out this, this point perfectly for me, which is why we're going to spend the majority of our time in the book of Romans. But you look at the very first chapter in Romans chapter 1, verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. What is it that's revealed? Grace? Peace? Happiness? No. The wrath of God against unrighteousness. And Paul builds on that in chapter 6, which is where we're going to spend the rest of our time. It's going to be our focus. Uh, So if you will, if you've got your Bibles, turn with me to Romans chapter 6. The passage was too big to put on the screen. And I'll be honest with you, even if it did fit on the screen, I probably wouldn't have put it on there because I want you to actually have the word in front of you. I want you to actually have it open where you can lay hands on it, you can look at it, and you can follow along and you can help keep me honest. Romans chapter 6, I want you to see how the gift of God is described. And I'm going to, get, I'm going to attempt to emphasize this in three points. You can already see the one on the screen. The position that sin has placed us in. In this same passage, he's going to identify the practice of living in Christ and then the promise of God's blessing, that greatest gift. The position, the practice, the promise. So in Romans chapter 6, let's begin reading in verse 17. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, 
So now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This section in Romans chapter 6 bookends the entirety of the position we find ourselves in. Verse 17 says that you, me, every one of us in this room, every one of us outside of this room are or were slaves to sin. Verse 23 bookends that by saying the wages of those sins, the earnings, the, the things you earn for every poor choice you made in your life is death. That is the wages of sin. Yet how many people do you know today that are going to take something like sin as a joke? They're going to treat sin like it's a joke. God's wrath is not a real thing. It's not going to happen. The only verse, the only idea of God that the majority of Christians can vomit out of their mouth is God is love. Completely out of context, no clue what it means whatsoever. That is the, that is the most we can come up with is God is love. And the same people that will make that argument will say, well, I believe what the Bible says and will completely ignore passages like this altogether. You say, well, I don't really understand why we're going to talk about this at Christmas. Do you, if you want to know what the best gift is, you have to understand this. Sin is the most debilitating thing that has ever entered into this world. It has killed, listen to this, sin has killed every single person that has ever lived with the exception of two people, Enoch and Elijah, that never died. They were called to heaven without death. Outside of that, sin has killed every single person. Sin is a direct, or death is a direct result of sin that took place in the Garden of Eden. And sin is never described as anything other than what it is in the Bible. It is never sugar-coated. Joshua chapter 7, verse 13, refers to sin as an accursed thing. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 de describes sin as a stench of a rotting corpse. 1 John chapter 3 says that sin is lawlessness against God. And if you had any doubt about it whatsoever, sin is described as pollution for your very soul in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Does that sound like something fun and playful? Do you understand this, that if sin had its way, if the sinners had their own choice about it, God would not be a problem. In fact, if sin had its way, God would be eliminated altogether. And I don't know if you've ever looked at sin like this, but I, I hope you have, of the dangers of sin. Keep your finger there in Romans chapter 6 and turn back to Jeremiah chapter 13. I want you to see something that Jeremiah says in this passage. Jeremiah chapter 13. Jeremiah says this, sin is incurable. There is nothing you can do about it. Jeremiah 13, verse 23, Can the Ethiopian change his skin, or the leopard change its spots? Then may you also do good, who are accustomed to do evil. Now, do you understand what Jeremiah says there? He said, you have no more chance of changing your sinful heart than a leopard does changing its spots. Do you know how powerful sin is? The only price that's sufficient enough is eternity in hell. That's how powerful sin is. And as a man today, as a woman today, either right now or at some point in your life, you specifically, every one of you, were or are a slave to sin. It had complete control of your life. If you've seen a junkie on the street scratching and itching and, and, and looking for their next fix, that was you to sin. You were the exact same. Romans 1.21 says that our hearts and our minds were completely given into sin. And see, many still live that way today. Sin is why our world is what it is. That's why there's evil. That's why there's hurt. That's why there's pain. 
That's why there's wickedness. I told you a while back. If you ever ask the question, why is all of this? Why is there cancer? Why do we have coronavirus? Why is there death? Why? Sin. That is the cause of everything. And Romans 6.23 says, sin is why there is death. Now the problem we have with something like Romans 6.23 is you take that to mean, well, sin is why somebody dies. It's not talking about physical death. Everyone in this room is going to die. Unless the Lord comes back, everyone in this room is going to die. That is our outcome of living in a sinful and fallen world. We're all going to taste death. Romans 6.23 is not talking about death, physical death. It's talking about the second death. It's talking about eternity. And I, had a, I heard this uh, old gospel preacher said this, and this was back when I was a teenager. And I've tried to piece it back together because bits and pieces have been stuck in my mind. But what it was was they, they'd come to this old gospel preacher and they were trying to get him to speak out against a local gas station that was going for their liquor license. They were going to start selling alcohol and they were, they were, they were close to a school. And so they were saying, well, hey, you need to speak out against this. And he said, I'm not interested in doing that. And it upset people that he wasn't interested in doing that. But his point was, if they're desiring sin, that's not going to stop them. You're fighting a losing battle. To, you're not going to stop them. But then he said something that, that really, I don't know, kind of stuck with me. He said, if that's where they plant their flag, if they plant their flag on the side of sin, that's their choice, then I hope they live it up to the best of their abilities. Because the only thing awaiting them is hell. And this is as good as it's ever going to be for them. And that, that stuck with me when he said that. I never thought about it like that, that if that's the choice you're going to make, if you, you're going to just ignore the gospel, if you've, you've planted your flag on the side of sin, he said, I'm not interested whatsoever, you might as well live it up. Because next, hell's going to come knocking. That's what sin does. That's why our greatest need today is not a gift under the tree. It's Christ. It is forgiveness of our sins only found in Jesus Christ. Now, people love seeing the mangers. I could take a show of hands and say, how many like seeing nativity scenes? I, read, I love seeing nativity scenes. I love reading through Luke chapter 2. But I hope every one of you understand this. That passage in Luke chapter 2 should humble you. It should knock you to your knees. If the leopard can't change its spot, then what hope do you as a sinner have of ever escaping from a dying world? Well, the, the manger that Christ was placed in his birth story proves the point that you could not do it if not for him. So then we read something like Luke chapter 2 that says God came in the lowliest of forms, a baby that was completely vulnerable. He left his throne in heaven to be placed in a manger meant for animals also that you could escape the very wrath of God because God is going to punish sin. So what then is the result of the coming of Christ? The bringing of the gospel, our practice of being, in, a, being a Christian today. Well, we don't have to worry or wonder about this. Paul is going to make this point very clear. Two times in the same passage I just read for you that says you were dead in your sins, that, that the, the wages of sin is death. Two times in the same passage he says you are free from sin. You as a Christian have been set free. So again, we think the greatest gift is happiness, peace, comfort. We think the, the gift of, of Christ is healing from sickness. The gift of God is being set free from his wrath. Being free from your sins. These chains have been loosened, but now again, there's another problem. We can say something like sin doesn't have the same power over you because you're now a Christian. And if we go no further, you're left vulnerable. Do you know what that does for you? All it does is it gives you the choice. That's what the power of Christ gives you is the choice. You're still going to be tempted just like you were the day before you were baptized. You're still going to be tempted every time you walk out the door and you see some flag. You're still going to face every single temptation. You're going to struggle with every sin that you once did. 
But now in Christ, you have the power to choose. Say, I'm not going to give in to that. I'm going to seek things that are above. I'm not going to be a slave to sin any longer. I'm going to submit myself to God. It gives you the choice to do that. Before you had no choice. You were a slave to sin. You had no choice. Just like a leopard can't change his spots, you couldn't change your, your scenario, your setting in your life. But you have to realize this. There's only two. Do you notice the, the two that Paul mentions? You're a slave to sin or a slave to God. That's it. That's the only two options. And I hear people make this argument. Well, I'm not against God. I'm just not for God. I, I'm, I'm neutral is what those I, I'm just kind of in the middle. Apparently they've never read Matthew 12 verse 20. You see, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12, you're either with me or you're against me. That is the only two options. And what Christ did to give you the power to choose which one you are. You can set your identity as a child of God. Paul uses that term slave or slave to sin. Now this promise that we began looking at in this series began in the Garden of Eden. It flows through the Old Testament like the, the scarlet cord of Rahab all the way up to the birth of Christ. It says, when the time was right, God would come into this world. And he did so in the lowliest of forms. That's the Christmas story. You know, I was talking to Melissa about this yesterday. And I would find myself getting lost. I, I told her I haven't really been much in the Christmas spirit this year. Uh, in fact, we were walking through this little tinsel town set up by our house. And there was a little bitty baby tree. And all the, all the big lit, like lit up trees and one little baby tree. I was like, yeah, that's kind of my Christmas spirit right there. I just kind of the little tree. That's, that's, that's about my spirit. But I did tell her this, and this is probably where I've reflected the most. That, Like sitting in our living room looking at our Christmas tree, um, I found myself daydreaming several times just looking at it. Not at the, we got a big star on top, not at the star on top, not at the gifts around the bottom, which are all going to be either hers or the kids. I doubt Justin's got anything under there, but that's okay. I'm not bitter about that at all. Uh, I'm really not. But what has fascinated me and what has just had me daydreaming so much staring at is the light. The, the glow. I can see the light on the corner of our wall that it sets in this corner. And it's just this reflection. It's just fascinated me. And I told her, I've just sat here and just stared at that light. And the best gift has become abundantly clear to me in doing so. It's the light. That is the gift of creation. It is the light. It is the light that shines in darkness. And as amazing as the prophecy of the birth of Christ is, as amazing as the fact that a virgin could give, it could not happen if it was not a miracle, do you realize when you read Luke chapter 2, the Bible jumps immediately past it. 20 verses is all you get. And it jumps past it. And it moves on to what it means. And so finally in Romans 6, Paul is going to describe the gift, the gift that we find in Christ. The best gift. See, verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift, the gift is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I hate to break this to you if you didn't know, but Jesus didn't stay a baby. He didn't stay in a manger. He grew up. He became a man in every aspect of his life. He put God first in every aspect of his life. He took the full wrath of God upon his shoulders so that you could experience eternal life. That's the Christmas story right there. That's what it's all about. And it's no coincidence you can find within the, the birth account of Jesus Christ all of these comparisons that are made. When Christ was born, they, they wrapped him in these swaddling clothes. Swaddling clothes are a lot like bandages. Guess where he had bandages wrapped upon him? At his death. At his birth, they, they placed him in this manger scooped out of a log. Well, that log became, was a tree that became the cross of Calvary. There was no room at the end. You know, I think I preached on that last year. There was no room at the end and what that really meant. Well, reality is there was no room for him in a sinful world. The world wanted to get rid of Jesus. And so I make this statement every year at this time. The manger always looked forward to the cross. If you are a child of God, if you are blessed because you have experienced God's grace, it is only because the wrath of God was poured out on Jesus Christ. That's the Christmas story. That's what hope is about. 
And that's what's so amazing to me. And I, and I said this in the beginning. It's not, it's not just amazing that God would take on flesh. It's not just amazing that God would be placed in a manger. But it's that he would do that for a bunch of sinners like us. That's what's so amazing. Knowing that we would reject him time and time again. I hope you'll take this with you this week. If you find yourself looking at a Christmas tree this week, don't get lost in the gifts. Don't get lost in the ornaments. Don't get lost in the topper. Look at the lights. Look at the lights. Now I want you to remember this passage. John 8, verse 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Paul said, you're either a slave to sin or you're a slave to God. You know, we love the idea of celebrating Christmas and what it means and, and what you've been told the birth story is, the gift of Christmas. And we love hearing about that, but then we'll walk out of church and we'll go live in darkness. That's not accepting the gift of Christmas. My prayer for you today is that you're sure of where you stand in this life. The best gift that God has offered to all people is free for you to take. The only thing Jesus requests of you is submission to him. You're a slave to sin or you submit to God. That's it. You know, I reflect upon this now that Christ made me free. That I'm free to choose whether I'm going to be that slave or I'm going to submit. I'm free to walk in his light. I'm free from the fear of death. And I'm comforted in that. If you cannot boldly say the same thing today, if you can't say that confession that I know I am a child of God, I know that I am set right, I know that my, my sins have been forgiven, then I want you to accept the gift that Christ gives you today. I want you to repent of your sins. I want you to give your life to Christ. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commands. He's not saying you got to go give blood. you got to go do it. He just says, submit yourself to him is all he's asking for. And if you are ready today to give your life to Christ, then repent of your sins, be baptized in a watery grave, and have God. We're not going to add you to the church. You're not going to submit a letter to me, and I'm going to read, I'm going to read, and you're going to be added. God is going to add you to the church when you submit yourself to him. That is the gift of Christmas. That's what it's all about. If you have not accepted this gift today, Melton is about to lead us in an invitation song. And I want to encourage you to search your heart. And if you're ready to answer that call, come now as we stand and we sing this invitation song.